Everyone can stand with me again, please, and turn in your hymnals to page number 85. Page number 85. O oh, come, all you faithful.
Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. It sure is good to be here in the Lord's house. It's been a custom at Bible Way for long before I came. Uh, one of our members, John chapter number one. Do pray for those that aren't able to be here. To several that texted or called and said they were not well, not feeling good. And uh, we appreciate them and want to say that we're praying for you and hope you get to feeling better soon. Amen. And uh, Wendy and myself, well, two Christmases ago, we were both down with COVID. So we were home all Christmas long by ourselves with COVID. Then last year she got COVID again during Christmas. And so she has been threatening anyone that would might have a cough and just, I don't know. She's been throwing around holy water and everything. It's like the guy in Vietnam. He had a, a, a necklace on. It had a bunch of things. It had a cross and a star of David and, and other things. Uh, you know, the half moon of Islam and all that. And another friend of, him, of his looked over at him as they lay in a foxhole together and said, well, what are you? He says, I'm not sure. But in my position, I can't afford to offend anybody. So, Amen. But thankfully, we know who we have believed, amen, and are persuaded that he is able to keep that which we've committed unto him against that day, amen. He is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, this time of the year, we set aside remembering his birth and uh, remembering why he came. It's not just that a baby was born. This was a special baby. Now, we know that Matthew and Luke are the two Gospels that share the most information about the birth of Jesus. And uh, then for, for that, Mark and John do not have so much as, as uh, the other two do. And so for that reason, many people have tried to bring into question some of the details concerning the birth of Jesus. For example, many have used that truth to say that we're not sure that he was born of a virgin. Well, you might not be, but I am. God's word is very clear that this was an unnatural birth. It was something special, a miracle that was done by the Lord God himself. And the angel told Mary that which is of in you is, is of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost put that, that baby inside her womb and Jesus began. And I've always thought about this too. Why didn't Jesus just manifest himself as an adult man? He could have done that, couldn't he? He could have take on, taken on a body as an adult man and then started his ministry and died on the cross. But, you know, for the redemption work of Christ, it took everything from the very beginning to the very it is finished. Amen. He came and, and experienced every aspect of humanity. There, were, there was no question about his humanity. He was 100 percent God and 100 percent man. He was born, he, he grew in the womb and was born into this world, lived his childhood, and then as a man, he served in ministry for three years and then was crucified on the cross of Calvary for you and me, for our sins. Then the Bible says he rose up from the grave. He spent another time here, a, month or, a little over a month here on the earth after his resurrection, and then he ascended in his body back to heaven. Now think about this. Everything about God is eternal except for his body. Eternal means from time before time and till after time or through after time. Everlasting means from now until forever. But the body of Christ came into being. The Bible says he took on him the form of a man came into being but it'll never stop. He is now in heaven seated on the right hand seated on the right hand of the Father making intercession for us the Bible says. And one day he's going to resurrect us the, the believers and then after seven year tribulation on earth he is bodily returning to this earth. And I think sometimes we think of Jesus Christ as now a spirit. He's not, he is in his body. And when he resurrected, some of the disciples said, you're a spirit, you're a spirit. He said, give me something to eat and I'll show you. 
And he ate some food to prove to them he was not a spirit, but he was in his resurrected body. He became flesh on this day that we celebrate, was born. He was actually before that, nine months before that, came to this earth and grew as that fetus in the womb of his mother. And that was the beginning of his physical body. He took on him the form of man. In John chapter 1, we're going to read 18 verses, if you would, and are able to stand with me to honor the Word of God as we read here out of the Gospel of John. Just because he doesn't give a lot of detail about the birth of Christ doesn't mean he doesn't mention it. In the beginning was the Word. For those that may not know, that is a capitalized word, and that is Jesus Christ. That is one of the names of Jesus in the Bible. We'll show you here in a minute where that is. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If your Bible says anything different, you've got the wrong Bible. There are some versions of the Bible that says the Word was a God. He was not a God. He was the God. The same, this Word, Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, made by Jesus. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. John was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. There are no people on this earth with an excuse for not believing in Jesus Christ. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. and We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. This is speaking to the eternality or the uh, that God is Jesus' deity. John was born physically first. But John is saying Jesus was before me. Anybody who knew what was going on would understand what he was saying here. And of his fullness have all we received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. In other words, we have seen him through the Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning as we look into this passage about the coming of the light. What a wonderful joy it is to know we have the truth. God, we have in our possession the Word of God, the written Word that declares the living Word. Lord, help us this morning that should there be a lost one among us, that the Holy Spirit would work in their heart and and stir them to salvation, God, before it's too late. Lord, we believe, we understand this truth to this morning. You came, was born, died for us, because of us. Lord, we thank you for that gift, the unspeakable gift. We give you the praise, honor, and glory for all you do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you would, real quickly, go with me to 1 John. We have several places we're going to look at this morning, so I need you to have your Bible handy and uh, turn quickly. The book of 1 John in chapter number 1. Again, this was penned by the same 
uh, apostle, but it was also authored by the same God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And in 1 John 1 and verse 1, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Some have said what a joy and privilege it must have been for John and Peter and all these men who were able to be in the very presence of deity, in the very presence of God, to touch him, to to look upon him, to eat with him, to commune with him. But I'll be honest with you, I would not trade places with any of these men. Because what they were going through and even the trials of affliction that they and the early churches went through have developed a path and prepared where we are today, where we're sitting in a beautiful building in comfort, worshiping and thinking upon and praising our Lord Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What a privilege we have to be where we are. Now go over to chapter number five. God made us and born us, if you would, or put us into this time for a purpose. You are born with a purpose. Every one of us has a purpose. Amen. In chapter five and verse number seven, the Bible says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the father, the word and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Again, if you have anything in your Bible different from that, you have the wrong Bible. They are not as one. They are one. You say, well, explain that. I can't explain it. I love what A.W. Tozer said. If I could explain God to you, he wouldn't be worth worshiping. We worship a God that transcends understanding. He is beyond all understanding. He is the one who has created logic, created the world and the physical laws that we have to abide by And he sets those laws aside at any time he pleases. Thankfully, at any moment, one of those laws will be set aside and we will lose relationship with gravity. And as believers, we're getting out of here. Amen. The Bible says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, with a trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the same Jesus that was born in the manger. Then in Revelation chapter 19, all of these passages having to do with the name word, speaking of Jesus Christ in verse number 13. This is speaking of Jesus. I saw heaven open in verse 11. And behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. This is the Lord Jesus. And he is he is describing that moment when the Lord is seated upon his horse and ready to return to this earth to defeat the wickedness of man and to establish his everlasting kingdom. What a joy. We're going to be there with him. And so he says, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written which no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That is the same that we see in John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word became flesh. God the Son took on the flesh of man and came and visited us. As the psalmist wrote, What is man, man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Emmanuel was his name. The word Emmanuel means God with us. Not God with us in presence or spirit, but in physical form, God with us. What a joy to know that Jesus came, amen? But where I want to look at this morning and spend some time is in verse 14 and onward. The Bible says, A word was made flesh and dwelt among us, 
You see, Jesus did not begin to exist. He only took upon him the form of flesh at that point. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and listen now, full of grace and truth. I want to look at that phrase this morning, and the title of the message is, He Rules the World with Truth and Grace. We all know the carol, Joy to the World, in the last stanza says, he rules the world with truth and grace. And I'm thankful for that mixture, that perfect mixture of truth and grace. Truth without grace would leave us hopeless. Because the truth is, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That is truth without grace right there. Truth without grace leaves us, us without hope. It leaves us lost. It leaves us corrupted. Look around you. This world is broken. Man is not getting better and better and better. Every invention and every imaginative creation of man drives us further into darkness. These wonderful and amazing tools and instruments that we carry around with us has led to just more darkness. We cannot defend mankind. Mankind is indefensible. There is no hope for us. We are all gone away. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But Jesus didn't just come as truth. He came as grace and truth. If we look down a little bit further to verse number 17, he says, for the law was given by Moses. That's what the Jews like. They're with the law. Moses, Abraham, the fathers, they gave us this. Well, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. The law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Did you know grace is a New Testament term primarily? You'll find it in the Old Testament, but by the context you realize it's not talking about saving grace. Although don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the Old Testament saints were not saved by faith. But we live in what is called the age of grace. Because grace was unfathomable without the object of grace, that means of grace, which was Jesus Christ. Grace comes through Him. Grace was something that the Old Testament only dreamed of. The Old Testament was focused on the law. The Old Testament drove men to a brokenness, a grief, understanding there is no hope. Jesus reiterates in the New Testament that no man is justified by the deeds of the law. No man has ever been justified by the deeds of the law. Those Old Testament saints were relying upon the Lamb of God which had promised He would come. And He came. Their grace was a dream. It was a hope. It was something they looked forward to. But you and I live in that age. Something Abraham dreamed of and Jacob dreamed of. We have. The New Testament presents truth with grace. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. If you would, Ephesians chapter number 1. In verse number 13, it says that in verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. 
the gospel is more truth than they had in the Old Testament. We need truth. Ephesians 6, 14 says, to have your loins girt about with truth, but truth without grace will bring no hope. Truth only brings understanding that we've got a problem. We need truth, but we need grace. I want to tell you a few things about this idea of grace and truth. Don't get me wrong, I love truth. I love all of the Bible. But first of all, I want to say that grace is better than truth. The Bible says so. Go with me to Hebrews chapter number 8. Hebrews chapter number 8. Romans and Hebrews are two great books to look at when you're dealing with this idea between truth and grace because they are both trying to deal with these Jewish believers who still are stuck on this twisted uh, imagination or teaching that God never intended for them that they were somehow sanctified or justified by works. When Titus tells us it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. In Hebrews 8 and verse number 6, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. You have better promises than Abraham had. Isn't that a blessing? We have a better covenant. God is so good to us to give us something better than truth. And all of creation longed for, waited for, held their breath for that moment when grace would come to this earth. And he did. Full of grace and truth. I'm glad he didn't just come full of truth. Amen. See, that's what the, new, the, the Jewish people felt like he was. The Messiah would come in all truth. He would establish his kingdom and would glorify Israel and would, would justify them and make them make everybody know that they were right. And when Jesus didn't do all that, instead he corrected them and he condemned them and he told them they were wrong. They didn't like that. From the beginning, they wanted to destroy him. They tried pushing him off of a cliff. And he just walked through the middle of them. What was it they were so angry about? They were angry because they did not understand and could not accept the concept of grace. But Hebrews 4.16 tells us, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of Grace. Amen. Is God truth? Yes. He told the, he says in his word, talking about Christians, believers, sanctify them. Thy truth. Thy word is truth. Yes, as believers, we should have truth. We should sanctify ourselves through that washing of the water of the word of God. That's not salvation. That's just living towards God, trying to reach the place he wants us to reach. The truth will not get you to heaven. Truth condemns you. Truth is justice. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is truth. If that was all the Bible was, is verse after verse after verse. The wages of sin is death. Boom, boom, boom. Truth, truth, truth. We would be in trouble. People have always cried, I want justice. I want justice. As far as it goes between us and God, I don't want justice. I want grace. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I looked at every verse in scripture about truth and I never found truth to help in time of need. Understand what I'm saying here. The law, that's what truth is. You look at uh, Psalm 119, I believe, truth and law uh, throughout that entire passage again and again and again. Every verse just about mentions scripture, the word of God. And truth is one of those descriptions of the word of God. We are condemned by the truth of who we are. It is not that that saves us. It is grace, and therefore grace is better than truth. Amen. Number two, grace is greater than truth. Go with me to Romans, and by greater, I mean larger, more powerful Romans chapter number five. Romans chapter five and verse number 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. That's the truth. Amen. The truth entered, the law entered, that the offense may abound, that we may find ourselves completely hopeless, in need of help. But, aren't you thankful for that little three-letter word? But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Grace is greater, it is bigger, it is more powerful than truth. The truth is, you deserve hell. But grace says, come to heaven. The truth says, you deserve punishment eternally in the lake of fire for your sin. But grace says, I've taken it upon myself. Come and take of the water of life freely. What a blessing. And so when we see here in John, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. He took truth that everyone was afraid of and married it with grace. And now we have hope. Amen. Grace is greater than truth. John chapter number one and verse 16 For and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. You know what that little phrase grace for grace means? Grace on top of grace. More grace. Amen. I like second helpings, don't you? A lot of times we'll go to buffets or places. We've been to that commedia thing where they have the food out on the stage. and Man, that's good. You go through there and I go, I go through the line. I get my potatoes because I like potatoes. I do that. I get the potatoes. I get maybe a vegetable. Depends on what it is. Cauliflower. No, maybe green beans with some bacon in it. Bacon is redemption. That's a good illustration. (laughs) Bacon is redemption for green beans. But you get to the end and there's a guy there with a silly hat on and he's got a knife and he's got this lump of meat. And he said, would you like some roast? Yes, sir. And he shaves off this paper thin piece. That's about two inches by four inches. And he puts that on your plate and I look at him and I'm like. I paid for this. I want more. Hey, man, I'm not embarrassed to say so. I I did, and the second time I went through, and he looks at me, and I said, make it thick. I did. I want a thick slice, amen. I was trying to be nice about it, amen, especially the second time because I wasn't quite as hungry. Grace for grace. He slices it thick, amen. He makes it plenteous. He doesn't leave you wanting, 
Grace is abundant when you come to him. Amen. Yes, grace is greater than truth. And then number three, grace is stronger than truth. Go to Romans with me. Romans chapter number six. Verse number 14. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves service to obey his service ye are to whom ye obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? But verse 14 says, sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. You know what he's saying is you have the power to overcome sin in your life. But it's not your power. It's not willpower. It's not some secret. It's not something you're going to learn in a seminar. There's only one thing that will help you to live a godly, holy life. That is grace. Grace is stronger than truth. The truth is, in your flesh you are weak. You cannot live right. You can't. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 10. This is the Apostle Paul writing here. And if anybody, and he says this, by the way, if anybody is able to boast about what they are, it would be him. One of my heroes in the word of God. Tremendous man of God. Fought through trial and affliction and served the Lord faithfully. We don't see failure in his life after his salvation. But he says in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me. How was Paul able to do what he did? Grace. That's what he said. Truth was this. Truth was, Saul was a man that had hate and anger in his heart. He was a man who had ambition to rise up in the ranks of the Pharisees to the Sanhedrin. He was a man who was willing to kill and did kill to get what he wanted. A holy man of God named Stephen preached a great message. The people that heard the message that day were so angry, they came upon him and bit on him with their teeth. And then they took stones and began to stone him to death. And the people that were getting stones, and they got hot. They took their coats off and laid them at the feet of one named Saul, who was consenting unto his death. Paul lived with that. For those that may not know Saul and Paul, they're the same person. He lived with that every day of his life. It haunted him. It grieved him. He said, I am the chiefest of sinners. And when he said that, there's no doubt. He looked on the face of Stephen in his memory. But every day Paul got up and served God. How could he possibly do it? Only one way, and that was the grace that is stronger than the truth. Maybe you're living with a truth that you're having trouble with. A truth of a past of abuse, a past of hurt, a past of sin, a past that is so filthy, you don't even want anybody to know where you've been. Can I tell you that might be the truth, but grace is stronger than the truth. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Wonderful grace. 
of Jesus. Again and again, we see it in our hymn book. The grace of God is exalted and glorified and we rejoice in it. He says, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me. You want to know the secret of overcoming who you are? Overcoming truth in your life? It's not some program. It's not some chemical. It's not a drug. It's not, it is grace. And it's stronger than truth. The truth may be that you are so depressed that you're ready to go take pills and end it all. You feel like that truth is greater than anything, but can I tell you, there's nothing greater than grace. There's nothing stronger than the grace of God that stands ready and willing and excited about forgiving your sin and washing you clean in the blood of Jesus. That's grace. Go to 2 Corinthians with me in verse number, chapter number 12. Oh, I'm thankful for the grace of God. Oh, I love truth. I like to remember what I used to be. I like to look back and see where God has brought me. I like to think of how dirty I used to be and how clean I am now. Not by my works, not because I've done anything good, but by the grace of Jesus Christ. If he had not been born, I would not have that. I would still just be holding truth. Second Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 9, the Bible says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient. If you remember this, as Paul was talking about this thorn in the flesh, this uh, messenger of Satan, he said. You have a messenger of Satan in your life, there's no doubt about it. Everybody can look at me as pious as you want. Let's see. Put on your pious, the most pious face you got. Let's see it. Amen. Brother Weisinger, that's tremendous. Well done. We can look like we're all okay and put on our tie and come to church and sit here and smile at everybody. But when we're all alone, uh, the darkness closes in around us uh, and we have that thorn in our flesh, uh, that, that sin that so easily besets us. Uh, and in frustration, we cry out to God, God help and grace comes running. Oh, I'm so thankful for grace and I'm glad grace is stronger than truth. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. He didn't say my law is sufficient. My word is sufficient. You read and do everything I said. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love the Lord God and that'll help you. No, no. He said you need grace and it's enough. My grace is sufficient for my strength, the Lord said, is made perfect in weakness. There's nothing that glorifies God like a weak, puny human being surrendering to God and saying, Lord, you do it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Most gladly, therefore, Paul said, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. When I'm down in the pit of despair, I cry out to God. The first thing I see is not a mean chastening hand, not a rough chastening mean savior. God who demands perfection of me. No, I look up and say, God help, I've messed up. Now look up. You think by now I ought to expect it, but what I see is grace. Amen. Oh, I'm so glad. I don't look up and see truth. Because truth is ugly. Truth is bad. Jesus Christ said, look, that truth is going to be there but I'm going to combine some grace with it. My grace is greater 
stronger, better in truth. You're going to be all right. Hebrews chapter number 11. I'm sorry, chapter 13. It looks like 11 when your eyes are teared up. Hebrews 13, again, as I said, Hebrews is a great place to go to understand this because he goes through the whole thing talking about that balance of scale between law and grace. Because the Jews demanded law, law, law. You go ahead and demand law. If you have to abide by law, you will fail. No one in here can do one thing worthy of salvation. You can't do one thing worthy of hanging on to it either. I was saved by grace and I'm kept by grace. Amen. Hebrews 13, verse number nine. Be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with. Say it. Let's read that together. Be not carried about. Say, say it with me, okay? Let's read together. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Underline that in your Bible. It's a good thing that your heart be established with grace. You will never establish your heart with truth because the truth is you're not able. You're not worthy. The truth is you're filth. It's a song we sing at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. There's a line in that song that says, that he would devote that sacred head for such a worm as I. I heard a guy one time on the radio talking about that, one of these radio preachers that think they're smart, but they're really dumb. And he was saying, I think that's terrible. We ought to change the words of that song because, you know, God don't look at us as worms. We're precious in his eyes. I'm a worm. God didn't look down at you and think, boy, you're special. I think I'm going to save you. No, he looked at you and said, you're a mess. You need to be saved. But I love you. And I'll do it. That's grace. Not merit, but grace. That your heart be established with grace. I want to say it over and over again, that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So whether it, it's using meats, but food or anything that we may think will content our souls or spirits or hearts. Those who go to the bottle for contentment, those who go to drugs or those who go to legal means, too much food, pornography, go on down the list, whatever it might be that you go to, that will not establish your heart. There's only one thing that will establish your heart, grace. Well, we got to try harder. We need to cry out for grace. Every day we get up, we ought to be on our face. Lord, give me grace to take on this day. I need your grace. You told Paul that your grace was sufficient for him. And I'll be honest with you, I've read the whole thing about Paul's life. And I've got it pretty good next to Paul. So if the grace of God was sufficient for Paul, it is certainly enough for me. Amen. It should be no surprise that the last utterance of Scripture, let's go there. Revelation chapter 22. This ought not to surprise me, but when I came across it, I almost shouted. Look at this. The last thing the Lord says in the Bible. He didn't say, behave, you bunch of sinners. No. 
You ought to behave. I'm not preaching you guys go out and have yourself a blast. You know, go get in some sins of the grace of... No, God forbid, Paul said. But look what John wrote. The last thing the Lord said put in my word is this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He rules the world with truth and grace. I'm glad he doesn't just rule the world with truth. He rules the world, and I'm glad he doesn't just rule the world with grace. But he's taken a perfect blend. The only thing that allowed those two to blend together was his precious blood on Calvary. There are some truths that all of us must face. But as we face them, I want you to keep grace in the back of your mind. Truth number one, we are all sinners. Every last one of us. There is not a one in this room that can say, I've never sinned. I don't do bad. I keep, I pull a tight a line. I don't do anything wrong. Everything I do is fine. No, you're a sinner. You've had hate, anger, jealousy, rage, lust. Everyone in this room has been guilty of those things. That's the truth, isn't it? There's a phrase we have in English, the truth hurts. And it does. That's the truth we have to face. We are all sinners. Growing up, I met a, a preacher's wife and I was talking to her one day and she was, I don't, I'm not, I was young. I was probably way out of line. But, you know, when we're young, we know it all. I was talking to her and I said, you know, we're, you, you sinned too. No, I haven't. So wait a minute. You've never had a bad thought? Nope. She was insistent. She doesn't think bad thoughts. She never says anything bad. She's, and I'm like, whoa, something's wrong here. I was a young boy. I was just about to be, be a teenager and I knew better. Even the thoughts of our mind, God is judging. That's a truth that's hard to look at, isn't it? How can we face this truth that all men are sinners? By acknowledging grace. Number two, our sin has earned us the greatest penalty that is possible. That is eternal death. We, in our justice system, we used to have, I don't even know if any states do it anymore, we used to have what is called the death penalty, where that was reserved for shoplifters. I'm trying to see if anybody's listening. I think some of you have already gone on to lunch. You're eating that Christmas turkey already. No, the death penalty is reserved for the worst of the worst. Killers. The Bible says you are worthy of death, doesn't it? The wages of sin is death. That's a hard truth to face, isn't it? How do we face that truth? By acknowledging there is grace. Amen. Because of grace, that truth no longer applies to me. Because of grace, it may not only ever apply to you again if you will choose to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Number three, you say, well, how can that be? Remember, grace is greater than the truth. It's stronger than the truth. Number three, the truth number three that we need to face is Jesus Christ took upon himself our penalty. I think that's got to be the worst thing that you can imagine to watch someone else pay a price for your mistake. Wouldn't that be terrible? Being foolish with a gun and not 
following safety standards and precautions that you've been taught from the time you were a small child of making sure the gun's in the right point in the right direction at all times. Never point a gun, loaded or unloaded at an individual or anything else you wouldn't want to harm. And so careless, being careless with a gun and shooting someone and killing someone, that would grieve me. Jesus died not because of the Jew or the Roman. He died because of you. Have you ever tried to picture that? Why did Jesus die on the cross? And it's been an argument in the media and everywhere else for years. Well, it was the Jews. No, it's the Romans. No, it was this. It was that. It was you. Your sin put him on that cross. That's a hard truth to take. How do we accept it? How do we live with it? Grace. Truth number four. If in obedience to the gospel, we put our faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, he will forgive our sin. That's an amazing thing to think about, isn't it? You don't understand. I've heard people tell me this. You don't understand what I've done. Nobody would forgive me. Grace is greater than anything you have ever done. We already read it. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Aren't you glad for grace? Going back to our text in John chapter 1. So when somebody tries to tell you the birth of Christ is not in the book of John, take them here. It's all over the place. Verse number 14. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you and thank you for your grace. Lord, I'm so grateful that on that day, we don't know exactly what date it was. We've chosen December 25th. Christians have celebrated and memorialized this birth for for two millennia. But God, we know it happened. And Lord, not only was there a miracle birth, but there was a potential for every soul on this earth to receive the grace of salvation. Born that day in Bethlehem. God, there's no doubt a soul in this room that has never yielded never surrendered themselves to you. God, I pray this morning the Holy Spirit would convict them. They would make that choice. That they would get on this altar this morning, this very day, this moment, cry out for salvation. Lord, you've promised that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, I pray this morning you would do your work in the hearts of your people that a soul would be saved this very day. What a wonderful day to be born again on the day that we celebrate Jesus' birth. God, I pray you would take this feeble attempt, expound on this fantastic, deep truth. Lord, that you would bless it and that it would perform its work in the hearts of your people. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand.